Paul from, I'd like you to meet Lynette, Lynette Beavers. I believe you know Sean Donahue. Yes. Uh, and um, I'm from New Orleans. Uh, Sean is from Pennsylvania. You are from basically Toronto, is that correct? Yeah, well, Hamilton, but roughly Toronto, Canada, yeah. And uh, Lynette is from the greater Charlotte uh, metropolitan area, which is to say, uh, I think Rock Hill in South Carolina or something like that. And well, actually, I'm a Buckeye. I'm from what? Ohio, but I've been transplanted here and there. Well, anyhow, and she's with her beautiful yeah. children. Now, do you have all, all three of your daughters in the in the car here? Yeah, they are. Okay, well, let's introduce, introduce them to Paul Anna? and Sean. Anna, come up here to the camera. This one is my favorite. This is the youngest. And <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, say hi, everybody. Oh, hi. It's okay. Hello, Hannah. How old are you? Can you tell everybody how old you are? How old are you, Hannah? 17. No, how old are you really? 16. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's how old she thinks she is. Girl, She's girls eight. can lie about their age. It's okay. <laughs> I'm 11. Okay. Oh, you're eight going on 11? Yeah. You're only eight going on 11? I want to be 12. Oh, my God. No, I wanted 13, 13. I thought you were eight going on 25. No, I'm 13. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, you're eight going on 13? Okay. Leah, your turn. Move. <laughs> Leah. Stop. This I'm is old. Leah. And Leah, how old are you, Leah? I'm 16. 17. 16. Okay. okay, and this one, I don't know if you can see her. You may have to come up, Haley. Oh, Here, can you see her? Yes. Yeah, they can. This is Haley. She's 20 years old. She's 17. 20. Haley is 17. 20. Wow. Well, yes. Anyhow, welcome, yes. welcome to, to four, four beautiful women. What can I say? And uh, all I can tell you is that Paul and Sean and I are dedicated to a principle called the 14 words, and uh, we are particularly dedicated to the future, creating a world where your kids and all kids can have a better future. That's and, right. And that is really what we're here to talk about today, because Paul and Sean and I, when we get together, we're usually talking about nationalism and the survival of Western civilization. But I want to point out that uh, the, the survival of Western civilization is totally dependent on the survival of the family. That's uh, right. The family is our greatest institution. Our With, without, without the family, there is no civilization. There is no meaningful life. I'm going to take the name of that. That's true. And absolutely. Earlier, right earlier today, uh, Lynette wrote to me that she wanted to talk again. We, had, we did a podcast yeah, Tuesday night, and if Dan ever comes back, I, I wanted Dan to be here because Dan is the only person who okay, actually wrote an gross. essay yeah, about uh, our uh, our meeting yeah. on uh, on Tuesday. And he, as 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 a retired preacher, I think that he's got a very unique unique grumpy old bastard on this. But <laughs> Lynette wrote to me, and I quote. I hate this communist country we live in. And that's <laughs> a very like interesting point because in my right, what are we here to get? In my no. education, one of the one of the one of the key moments I ever had was when I took a course. No. Uh, I don't want to go with daddy. Marxism. Daddy. No way. Yeah. Marxism. Uh, it is usually associated with Karl Marx, obviously. Right, yeah, Marxism was Karl uh, Marx, right. His partner was Frederick Engels. And Frederick Engels wrote a book, uh, which was the key text for the course I took, the first thing we ever read. And it was called The Origin of Family, Private Property, and the State. And basically the purpose of, of socialism and communism are to destroy the family, private property, and the and the state. That is the goal of uh, uh, of communism today. And so, basically, I want to start out by asking Lynette why she wrote that this morning. 
because it inspired me. I hope it'll inspire you all. But I want to know specifically what it's because she's going through a lot right now. Her family has been under a long time. And I, I, I want to hear about this. Okay, so here we are. We're about to get out for Christmas break. And, you know, of course, the kids have school days. There's, I don't know what, 12 days, I don't know, out. But um, we literally just moved to South Carolina from Georgia. And I was homeschooling in Georgia. And I decided, I did some research in the area that we um, checked out the schools, checked the reviews, you know, greatschools.org. And they said, oh, the schools here are great. So I was like, okay, let's sign Hannah up for school. So we put her in school. <laughs> okay, hold on. And she's been having some stomach issues. Like she has anxiety and she was having some stomach ache issues. So she's been home for the last three days. And they said, you know, oh, you only get two parent notes. After two parent notes, that's it. You have to have excused doctor's notes, you know? <laughs> I was like, okay, so you can't have the days that you're only allowed to miss so many days of school, so apparently. <laughs> I got the hand so, yeah, it's just, there's, there's, a, there's, look, he's a, always an organization or government entity or someone agency that's telling you what you can and can't do what you have to do you have to do this xyz so yeah <laughs> so it was basically the, the fact that your your life is regulated right what? down to the minute by uh by a state authority that you were know, you were writing it. about this morning you should do this forever right i mean because we you know these kids spent two years in foster care you know, where they didn't even have any control over their lives. They had no control over their lives. They didn't know when they were going to see their parents again, had no idea. I mean, somebody was telling them, you know, where they had to go, what they had to do. And I mean, they couldn't even pick up the phone and call me. They weren't even allowed to have That's phones. That's terrible. They couldn't have phones for two years at, you know, 13 years, 14 years. They, they weren't allowed to have phones. <laughs> And just, yeah, that um, it, it's just, it, it's just horrific to me. The kind of, I mean, I understand that child abuse really does happen out there. I mean, it really does. But for innocent families that are accused of it, that it's really, it's really even worse to be accused of something that you didn't do. And then you spend your whole life, you know, you're like marked or, you know, like you can't, it's your, your name's put on a registry. You're going to have to appeal to get your name off that registry. Well, do you want to tell Paul, Paul and Sean, I mean, Sean has read, Sean watched the video from the other night and I don't think Paul has, but no, I haven't. Why, why don't you tell, why don't you tell, just give, give Paul a summary of uh of exactly what you're talking about here okay so leah the 16 year old the one with the long hair she had a, can, can I your okay yeah go if they're right there go with them it's okay okay all right so leah had a she was in the last year of her elementary school and yeah yeah two she there was a schoolgirl that you know was just typical kids they didn't invite her to a slumber party or something and then they made a video about her at the slumber party and then posted it on social media and and then at the end of the school year one of those children went to the school counselor with her mother lying saying that their dad was taking showers with her and her younger sister. Well, taking and not showers. just that. And oral sex, yes. Oral, oral sex in the shower, yeah. So this was some other adult made that report against uh, Well, the, the, the child 
with the mother went and said that. Uh, I got two things of Russian paper. Charles, this, 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 this led to the uh, break, basically the, the temporary breakup of the family. This uh, unfounded, untrue allegation. And Sean made a very interesting comment. Can I quote what you said hate? earlier? Well, I, I said several things earlier, but I just wanted to clarify. Was it the case that these girls at this, uh, you know, the, these kids who attended this this um, slumber party and had, you know, typical teenage events where they, you know, they don't, you know, they always leave somebody out. W weren't th those Wait, kids using accident. those allegations as a, the excuse to justify not having invited this other girl to participate in like you know their their hangout in their social circle it isn't was that what happened i mean i'm i'm not really yeah uh, the girls remember the slumber party the yeah what was the girl's name was kylie kylie martin. kylie martin yeah she was involved in all that with the yeah the slumber bar. I mean, we just really don't know with this. Okay. this all right. Kylie so, girl. so I, I really was don't know why she made all this up. We don't know why she made it up, but she said that Leah said something that she didn't say, and Leah's like, "I didn't say that." <laughs> okay, I, I I thought that was the 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 reason that they gave for not having invited uh not having invited Leah to to the slumber party was because of that that allegation. No, no, that happened after the slumber okay. party was before. That was just part of the bullying. That, I mean, that was all like, you know, she was being bullied by those girls, by a group of girls that like, yeah. And. Well, but the interesting thing I think is that from, from our standpoint oh is that the courts <laughs> grabbed a hold of this, Child Protective <laughs> Services grabbed a hold of this and they thought, wow, this is a chance to make this family dependent. That is the jargon. They, 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 they saw an opportunity to create dependency. Uh, well, because, a, yeah. A subject well, for yeah. services. Uh, well, let yeah. me ask you that. Is it true that no criminal charges were filed as a That's result right. of this? No, mm -mm, not at all. <laughs> okay. So, so then it, is it true that um, uh, given all these allegations that were made, there was no finding by any criminal court that that even the out the allegations didn't even rise to just the basic level for what's called a, pro a prima facie case to even file a simple uh, a charge it didn't even get a that far cause, correct well the detective lenny carr said what was it he said again charles you read that i can't remember what he said on the stand uh, that the girls proffered up adult the, 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 language yes the, 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 this is this is the amazing thing i mean i you know, Paul has uh, been involved in a lot of litigation where people are basically framed based on their speech. And mm. uh, this is a very interesting case because the investigator said that, the, that your kids uh, absolutely categorically denied everything, but they spoke in such an articulate clear manner that they it was obviously adult speech and yeah they, they were coached, been coached. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay well let me ask i just want to i want to make sure i understand this because i'm not certain i do this it is not in criminal court right this is no. not okay no this defects case is closed okay so it it did not reach the stand so, so, so absolutely no probable cause for any type of criminal charge was ever presented to any court. Is that correct? Is that right? Correct. No, I, I, no I, criminal not, charges not on, on this were filed. The children were given back. Issue, Defects but, cases closed. No, not on this. But yes, there's okay, another so, so, incident, but we can't talk about. <laughs> Sean, right. they, they, they retaliate. Just so you'll know, there's there's a retaliation case. Here. Yeah, I'm not surprised that they would get mad because. Um, it seemed to me that they stepped all over themselves in that um, this case, the, the opinion that I read seemed as if a judge was finding facts were not based that, that were not rooted in any evidence. It was just deciding that I'm saying that 
that this I find this to be credible, yeah. therefore I find this to be a fact, therefore it is. It also seemed to me as if the judge herself was sua sponte adding stuff that wasn't even in the initial <laughs> basket of allegations. And the judge felt that from the point forward where she had spoken, that her opinion alone would then become evidence and no one would ever trace it back to find out, okay, well, where are you getting this from? And that's why I asked the question, did, did this come from some sort of criminal case? But the judge made it sound as if she was citing to criminal, as, as if a conviction had taken place and now this is the ramification of family court, but there was nothing like that. So I don't, it, it, it appeared to me as if this judge was trying to set this up so that there, there would be a charge in, in criminal court and apparently one never came, so. Yeah, I mean, this judge even, her name is Sandra Miller and she's actually retired from the county we were at. Like after, like after our case went up there, she retired. She <laughs> ran from the bench after that and retired because I mean, Jack, I mean, here he is, he's an innocent Marine Corps veteran served in combat, Afghanistan and Iraq, served our country. We've been married 20 years. I have three children. And I mean, he has been accused of something horrific, sexual abuse, which he would never do with his children. And they just took it and ran with it like a dog with a bone because we were actually out at a Mexican restaurant and saw the judge there with her family. And we were walking, we were walking, me, me and he and I were walking out of the restaurant. She was like, you're a pedophile and I'm going to prove it. What? Wow. Yes. Yes. What? She that actually did so, say that. That's so that's, see, Charles, this is what I'm saying. I really thought there was a lot of su sua sponte activity in that opinion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think. Hannah, will you go get a buggy? That is wild. I didn't see? know that. that. That is just. Oh, yeah. Is, and she actually got that. in his face like we took a lunch break and they the judge and he were out in in the corridor like she even had her robe on and came out in his face like this to his face got in his face mm -hmm. okay Ch charles does that strike you as prosecuting from the bench perhaps well, I mean, I mean there, 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 there's a word, there's a word in the English vocabulary for yeah, what happens right. when a judge becomes the prosecutor. Paul, help us out here. What's, what do you, what do you call a court yes, where the judge becomes yes, the prosecutor yes, or, or Dan? Yes, Dan, uh, Sean, Sean Donahue, uh, Paul from Lynette, Lynette Beavers. Are you, are you, are you, are you fully? I think I'm good. Going? Good. Okay. Yep, you're good. Uh, what what do we what do we call what historically in in the Western world what do we call a court where the the a bank becomes the a bench uh, <laughs> oh a star <laughs> star chambers no there, there's a, there's a much more common word than that inquisition perhaps exactly it is a court of inquisition and every family court tends to, and well a lot of other courts too every family court though tends in the because world. of the uh, uh, the the uh, capture of major law schools by radical man-hating feminists. L law in much of North America is, especially in family law, is pathologically anti-male, and that and that judge the judge's behavior, I think, in any Anglo-Saxon jurisdiction would be co considered completely improper, uh, rendering some sort of a comment in public, not not from the bench, but in, in public accusing uh, her husband of being a pedophile uh, and we're going to get you. Uh, th th this is uh, outrageous, uh, uh, but it, it's typical of the, the man-hating uh, uh, ju uh, judiciary that's been captured by the, uh, uh, by the, the cultural Marxists and the radical feminists uh, right across North America. Lynette, I'd like you to respond to that as a woman. Do you, do you feel, do you, do you agree with that analysis? I'm sorry, I had a 70, I had a kid asking me something. What was that question again? The question is, do you, did you hear what Paul said? Paul said that he believes that uh, there is a radical feminist agenda uh, to emasculate people like your husband and that uh, this is the reason that they go that they will go to such lengths 
to make up stories and to intimidate uh, the- Masculate. The, I, I, the, do, I do believe there's some of that going on. I, I, I do believe there's, you know, a little bit here and there. I mean, there's, I, I agree that there's a, a, there's a big feminist between, you know, between men and women right now because it's, you know, salary, women, men, women get passed over when a man gets the salary and they, you know, they were there longer and they deserve it. So I, I do agree that that's probably more than possible that, that there, that there, you know, could be. Yeah. Total feminist agenda like that. But, but in the courts, you see in the family courts, <clears throat> Um, because of the radical feminist uh, takeover of many of the law schools, the, the belief is that the man is always wrong. Uh, the, 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 the men by, by, by nature are just exploiters and, uh, uh, and tyrants. And uh, the, I mean, this goes right back to Freud, who was, one of, who was adopted by the cultural Marxists. Uh, and his idea was that the family was a great form of exploitation. The man exploited the wife and the children. It was never quite clear to me how that happened, but uh, but that's the belief. So men bad. Uh, so any accusation uh, uh, against your husband uh, would immediately be, be, tend to be believed rather than, well, look, uh, this seems pretty wacky. Uh, we need some evidence. No, it, it, it's it's it, it, the mindset is, well, Men are just like that. Men are just terrible. All men. Yeah, I mean the the judicial system is just is just horrible when it comes to divorce. I mean yeah. it's 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 horrible. I mean, and the children are the aftermath. The children are the ones that have to, you know. That, that is cute. I like that. They're the ones that you know. I mean, they love their parents. They should. Yeah, that is. I love that. I know, an owl. Yeah, so I mean, these parents, I mean, these kids, you know, they love their parents. They just want to, they just want to have both their parents in their lives. Yes. And it's like the judicial system doesn't, doesn't care. It's not the best interest of the child. It hasn't been the best interest of the child for a long time. It's all about the best interest of the money. The goal <laughs> is to destroy family, fam the family, Mommy, like private property and the estate for the purpose of promoting socialism. Socialism and communism, and I mean, uh, you know, I, I think there's a slightly different angle here, and then I want to turn it over to Dan for a minute, because Dan wrote this marvelous uh, commentary uh, on 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 our conversation the other night. But mm. I just want to quote what George Orwell had to say about this in 1984. Yeah. That should be my you to reject all evidence of your eyes and ears. This is an ornament. It was the, it was the final, it. most it's essential it. command. Uh, and you know what I, what I see in the, what, what I think that Sean is saying about that order that was entered in your case is that the judge is specifically telling you to reject your, uh, uh, what your eyes and ears perceive it's telling your daughters to, and it is prohibiting your daughters from speaking competently. Yeah. This is the, 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 Sean and I had a little discussion uh, before uh, before we before we started about whether uh, we should have uh, your your children on this program or not. We did we did on Tuesday, and I just want to make clear that one of my big issues is I want to see children liberated to be part of the processes that affect their lives and the, the way that the children were, that your children were treated in terms of the evidence that they could have given and were prohibited no, to, give, the to give is scandalous. It is absolutely Why are we here? scandalous. Yeah. Can we go to the toilet? I don't want to look. That little girl, by the way, that little girl uh, that I, I say is my favorite. Uh, yeah. You know, they're, all, they're all beautiful girls, but that little girl was four years old. Or maybe four. Three, at the time, at the time of this alleged incident, and mm -hmm. to to falsely say that about a four-year-old girl 
I mean, if it, you, you see, if it were true, yeah. it would be a heinous crime that I think any of the any of the four of us men, we we probably if we had known about it, you know, we might have gone to Georgia, uh, and you know, executed uh, executed justice ourselves, because it is that it is that horrible. I. Uh, the idea of a four-year-old girl doing what she was alleged to have done, and she didn't get to speak, and the and her older sister who was uh, with her did not get to speak, even though the the recitation of the evidence in court was that the sister was the eyewitness to what allegedly happened. They would not allow the kids to testify at all. But they allowed. They the, would not they let them come the, to the court. Bully, the, 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 the alleged bully, this Kylie, who's not part of the family at all, they allowed her to testify that, by hearsay that this is what happened. So in other words. Yeah, she was allowed to make the allegation and her words were golden, but our children were not allowed to refute. They were not allowed to refute it. They were not allowed to say, no, this isn't true. This didn't happen. And, you know, I just want to point out that there was a point in 1945 where the English and American courts decided to abandon things like the rule against hearsay and to allow uh, people with no personal knowledge to testify as to facts. Uh, and oh, blocks? Uh, where was that? What? Blocks. You got blocks in it? Cool. Charles. Can can you adjust your microphone input to uh, increase the input volume on your microphone? You're not hearing. Me? I wish I knew how to do a background. I would do that so you guys don't have to see me moving around. No, it's, it's, <laughs> well, it's kind of hilarious, and obviously you're interacting with your. Now you're saying you can't hear me, Paul, uh, Sean. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. no. I don't know how to I'll, put a background up. I wish I knew you, how to do that. Could just. Oh, maybe it's because your microphone wasn't as close. Maybe that's what it was. Is this any better? Much oh, better, okay, much, much, much. Yeah. That like was that was, that was a problem. Okay, no, that's okay. That, that's anyhow. Uh, I I just want to make this comment, and this is related what? to the, to the topics that Sean, Sean, and Paul and I often talk about. Oh my God, you 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 changed coasts. <laughs> <laughs> you suddenly yeah. changed coasts. Yeah. Um, anyhow, that, that that basically in 1945, the decision was made that outcomes were more important than evidence, rules of evidence. Uh, and that was at the Nuremberg trials that closed World War II. And I think that's a very significant moment in the history of Anglo-American jurisprudence and that uh, we basically should never lose sight of that historical fact that uh, at a certain point, the outcome of a case became more important than uh, the way of establishing truth and you know the judge in this case does seem to have uh wanted to inform the reality of uh you know what was going to happen in uh in in lynette and jack's and their kids life and Charles, on the, that opinion though there there was there there was a contradiction that i felt i saw and that was the judge said she would oh, reject oh, the testimony of the elder daughter because the elder daughter had been estranged from the accused from for approximately I don't know it was something like two years or something. Oh, However, about five years. Five years. Yeah, okay. That's his daughter from another marriage. Amanda is right. his daughter from another marriage. Okay, now, now this this is the part that I find contradictory. The judge said because the elder daughter had been estranged for so many years, her testimony could not be taken as credible. However, the, the judge also said that because the sister of the mother had been estranged from the gentleman for about the same amount of time her testimony was therefore credible you can't get that stuff and i yeah. don't understand how uh the witnesses being estranged from the accused 
for a year, five years, whether or not their evidence is or is not credible. But then, since the judge decided it does, I don't understand how being a makes one witness testimony credible and the other not credible. I don't know. In In other words, the outcome is all that counts. Was, uh, was that was that judge's decision made without actually hearing the witnesses first? Exactly. No, I, she heard the witnesses first and decided which one she wanted to believe. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's like she picked and chose. She picked and chose who she wanted to say was credible and who was not credible. So she said, "I agree. I think that the testimony from witness alleged witness one credible." The reason it's credible is because she's so far removed from the accused, five years of being estranged, that um, she wouldn't be influenced in any way to not tell the truth. But then the other witness testified, and she said she she did not like that testimony, and she said, well... Yeah, but so. I hadn't seen that sister until 2009, and she hadn't seen Jack since 2009, but she okay, took but that testimony... Exactly. So this is what... nine. Okay. Yeah. So how many how many years of separation was that? Of of what the sister or the yeah or the, the, the sister the sister the daughter was yeah, five years the sister ago. that's like eleven years. Okay. So so Paul, this is what this judge did. This judge said the elder daughter from the other marriage uh, is not believable. No, and the reason I'm she's, she's not believable you, is because there was five years Honey. of separation. So and because there was five fine. years of separation, she probably uh, forgot or there's some other reason that her testimony would not be accurate. The sister, however, had 11 years of separation. So because the sister had 11 years of separation, there's no reason her testimony would be false. Well, because so, the know, lawyer didn't object with the right objection. You know, so I just I don't see how how this the. the the years of separation has anything to do with whether the testimony is accurate or, in or inaccurate. Oh, but if it does, how could it cause one to be false and one to be true? You see what I'm saying? Like why does it why doesn't the years of why why don't years of separation either always cause a witness to be more accurate or always cause a witness to be less accurate? I don't I don't think it does either one, but I don't see I don't understand the judge's reasoning on that. How, how Sean, 11. Sean, You're going to get Sean. presents, baby, for Christmas, honey. The... You just get Lazarus right now. <laughs> Why is that Walmart here? is not ideal. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to run to the car. I got to go. Right. Well, clearly, there, there was no. The judge was, as you said, she decided her conclusion. She worked her way back to the evidence. That, yeah. That's what she did. And, 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 it's very and clear I, that she did. I guess what I, what I think is that this is an extraordinarily uh, good. Uh, example of you know outcome uh, outcome determinative judgment uh, that uh, the the decision was made in advance. This family needed to be broken up. Yes. And the uh, interesting thing first. was when we got I mean, our kids back. Has, I, I I use. Hmm? Hello, Lynette. Well, she's frozen up for a bit. Yes. But well, how long were, were the kids uh, 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 taken away? Two years. Oh my gosh. Two years. Yes, two years. Two years. And they and during that time, uh, we learned last time we had Lynette that they were they they were put in four different uh, four three different, different placements. Homes. Three three or four. I count four, but they say three. But I it was four. Yeah, it was four placements. But see, the first the first foster person let them talk to me on the phone. So that's why they took them away from her was because she let them talk to me on the phone. And all of this is based on lies. Yes, now, all, all of this lies. is based on lies which serve uh, the, the government agenda of taking kids away from parents and making sure that the state decides how they're raised. I mean, it, 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 Lynette and her, and her husband, uh, you know, they deserve some kind of medal for coming through this yes. because it could have broken up the family permanently. 
That is probably what the what the court was hoping. But you know, there's some enough, the the caseworker the day our kids were being returned, they wanted a family picture. They wanted a family picture, but check this out. Before they got the family picture, she was like, "Oh, and and we don't care if you divorce. It, we really don't. We don't care if you divorce." Can you imagine how stressful? I mean, I, I, I love I, the, uh, Lynette can imagine, obviously, because you went through it. But the, I, I think it's difficult for me and probably Sean, uh, Sean and Paul too, to imagine what kind of stress this was for this family, for the kids. And the kids didn't have, of course, because the kids were not allowed to know what was happening. They were excluded entirely from realizing how preposterous the whole thing was. And well, it, it yeah, sounds they to were me shielded like and they, it was on, like they only knew what they wanted them to know. And the last foster mom, the last foster mom and I, we still talk and she's not even, she quit. She quit fostering kids after she had my girls because she could see that we were, that we loved our children. I even talked to her on the phone the other day. And she said that Jack and I are the only parents that cared as much about our visits, about seeing our kids, about sending stuff home with our kids. I mean, she said she has never had any, any, any parents, you know, with, with the foster kids that she was taking that took the amount of, you know, the amount of effort and how bad we wanted our kids back and so she knew that we weren't guilty charles you know something else that struck me about that opinion is the judge ordered uh an evaluation by uh, some psychiatrist or something and the psychiatrist said he couldn't find anything that the judge was looking for and the, the, the psychiatrist said that uh after doing his exam he did several different examinations and said not one of them uh, led him to conclude that uh, the accused had any propensity whatsoever to right. commit engage, sex, yeah, to commit. engaging in the kind of, of activities that the judge accused him of, and, you know, and, and it went down to a whole list. There was, there was more than at least three, but I think there may have been more of, of different uh, uh, evaluations that this particular doctor did. The doctor said, I don't find any propensity towards any of this, you know, um, and the judge then decided that the test, the, the, the examination was flawed and uh, that the, the guy beat the examination. That's what really happened. Here. He beat yeah, yeah. She was saying that he, oh, he's, he's, he's been trained well or something on how to, I uh, forget what, she's, what they said. Dan, I'd like you to get involved here. <laughs> so, I mean, I, no matter what this, this, no matter what evidence came out, the judge decided that any evidence that went against her conclusion had to be disc was discredited because she said so. And any allegation that was made that supported her conclusion became evidence because she said so. Like it didn't trace back to an actual finding of fact by a jury or any other finding of fact, only anything that you followed back from her opinion traced back to an allegation made by a person and each allegation was not just hearsay but hearsay of hearsay i heard you know people were, were hearsay saying, upon hearsay right they were saying well i heard this well who'd you hear this from i heard this from this other person okay so then that's that's at least twice removed and then the judge decided well we're going to take that to be fact and i, I <laughs> Wow. I don't see how she could do that <laughs> legally. I, I don't. I don't. Well, what she said was she did. She did. She did. Did it because the because the the parties did not object, and that of course suggests to me that the lawyers were directly involved in in creating the court desired outcome, which I think the lawyers are. Uh, and I mean this. This is this is one of the things I, I really wanted to bring up here is that. The system, the judges and the, the social workers, the so-called investigators, they are all working together for this same common purpose. Uh, Dan, do you have a chance to get it involved at this point? Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. But okay, you I, around. I'd like you to I'd like you to tell them I, that about what what your comments were and uh, and maybe give us your insight here, Pastor well, Dan Mack. First, hi. First of all, I wanted to let you know why I'm so distracted and excited. Um, I told Charles in that response to um, the video that he made with you this earlier this week that I knew a man who had been homeschooling his children and he had many of them and he had them taken away. I only know his brother, but I haven't talked to his brother for years and I just got him on the phone and his, bro and his brother like is six right. six or seven children? His brother is right there with him. And I said, well, let me get this link to you so you can jump on and they're willing to do that. So that's why I'm a little distracted and I'm, I'm a little bit trying to get them the link and I got a new phone and I don't know how to forward the link. Um, Oh, so you should I was be able just, to hold down on it, and then if you tap, oh, and hold there it down is. On there it, it is. Now, do I want to share? Or do to I copy? want to use forward? Uh, well, if you forward it, you could probably forward it to Charlie. No, I mean I can forward it to his text, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna forward it to to Dean's text. Yeah, you Dean. just hold down on it and forward it. Yeah. His name is Dean. My friend is Dean. And I won't give you his last name. I'll let him do that if he wants to. And his brother's name is Dale. And Dale is the one that went through hell, you know, uh, having his children taken away from him because they weren't in the system. Mm -hmm. Charles, what, while they're linking up uh, and going through the technical thing, um, I just want to tell you, when you started this video, you mentioned the, uh, the importance of family to Western civilization. Yes. And we just had a judge get elected, uh, a new state rep get elected to judge. And she'll be sworn in in a couple of weeks. And her claim to fame is she grew up in a family of adopted children, you know. And she brags about how qualified she is to be a judge because her parents had 40 foster children throughout their lives. 40, not four zero, 40. And I thought to myself, how in the world does this make you more qualified to be a family court judge? You clearly don't understand family. You understand the institution of the foster system. And because she grew up through that system and, you know, she got to be a law, went to law school, got to be a state legislator. She sees that system as the way to raise American children. So her parents had 40 foster children throughout her life, throughout their lifetime. So she thinks that's the way family should go. So she's clearly, and they love her. The, the public loves her. And I, I just think how asinine this is. Like, don't, don't you hear what she's saying? She's saying she grew up in a family that was a foster family where there were 40 foster children. There's 40 kids in class, in homeroom, not, not at home when you go to the kitchen and, and, and you, eat, you eat dinner, right? So people just think this is absolutely great. And I'm thinking to myself, you're not reading between the lines here. You're not hearing what she's saying. She's saying that your children will be better raised in a foster family with 40 kids and two parents, all of whom are getting a stipend from the local county courthouse for being the foster parents of your kids. How, how do you have 40 kids? Even if you don't raise them all at once, let's say in a lifetime, they had to have had at least three to 10 at one time, right? So you're essentially corralling the herd to feeding time and corralling the herd to bedtime, you know, you're not really having the family. That is not the family experience. So now this, this judge who's going to, who's going to be the family court judge, she doesn't have family experience. She grew up in a household with foster kids and had 40 siblings. She does not know what family is. So how, how in the world is she going to be a good family court judge? She's going to be a good foster court judge. Okay. It, it only, Sean, it only makes sense if what I said at the outside is correct. It only makes sense if the purpose of the family court is to, them. That, to promote the destruction of the family. I mean, uh, Paul they, just they, got up, but I was going to ask Paul. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe you know something about this in Pennsylvania. No, everybody on this call. What? Sure, Dan, what's up? Sorry. I, my wife, being a teacher, has her own opinions here, and I wish she would share them. But well, 
Okay, that that would be that'd be fine. We're we're getting a little bit chaotic here, but yes. Uh, the... But but do you see what I, what I'm saying? I don't I don't see how this particular judge does not believe in the family with the mother, the father, and the, and the, the two okay, or three but children. If, but but Sean, if if that is the state agenda, if we I mean if we I, I think that that's consistent with what I'm saying that the the state agenda is the destruction of the family. Paul, I mean uh, in Canada. Do you have uh, the the national government pushing and promoting foster care for children? Well, that in Canada, that's a provincial matter. But yes, the the the, the same mindset <clears throat> exists in, in many provinces where they're uh, only too eager to um, uh, to break up a family. And uh, uh, and of course the. Now the part of the cultural Marxist or politically correct uh, 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 worldview is that there are many families that they, that they hate the traditional family, man, woman, children. Uh, that's why uh, you know, we, we even have books in some provinces pushed into kindergarten or, 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 or grade one. Uh, uh, Debbie has two, four, two mummies or something. You know, the, uh, a family is like any grouping, you know, Two women uh, with a kid, two men with a kid. Uh, Takes a village. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, with, with with some races, it probably does take a village. But well, that that I mean, that's the philosophy. During you know that was touted during the Obama administration, especially. Right. It, uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton was putting pushing that back in the nineties. That's right. That was, yeah. It's her book. He's quoting the title of her book. Okay. And she, yeah, that's she where... probably didn't dream that up on her own. That was probably uh, fed to her. Okay. The, the, these ideas go back a long way. It's taken, uh, it has taken decades for them to become, I won't say mainstream, but certainly be, become uh, common fair uh, among, among our, our tyrannical rulers. The, that, the hatred of the traditional family goes back at least to uh, Freud, but may, maybe even further. But Freud was a great uh, was a great favorite of the, uh, of the Frankfurt School because he he hated the traditional family he he uh, he described it in terms of, of oppression the, the man oppresses the the, the 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 wife and the children I mean uh, I I couldn't explain how it's just more of this uh, you know uh, demented uh, uh, turn of the century Jewish bullshit from Vienna. I, I recommend want to again, the, myself. I, I'm recommending again the uh, book I mentioned by Frederick Engels as a place to start with this Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Uh, and that is, it, it, that is not even the beginning uh, uh, in, in giving. I've, I've got a, ca a cartoon uh, from uh, eight, the 1860 election where they attributed this general philosophy to Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans. Uh, very <laughs> interesting thing, but let's see. We, we, very, you, you mentioned Abraham Lincoln. It, it's very interesting. Abraham Lincoln had quite a correspondence with Karl Marx. Yes, he did. Uh, this is uh, perhaps not that widely known, especially for, for Americans north of the Mason-Dixon line who think of him as the, the, the great uh, emancipator. <laughs> I'm so far. I'm so from so far north. I, I, I'm not hobbled by such ideas. <laughs> well, south of the Mason and Dixon uh, line, we we, we know me. about that correspondence. But let's see, who's this? Me? Who? Yes, who's this? Who's this from area code three two three? That you're in Los yeah. Angeles. I'm in Los Angeles. My name is Coach Dean Golden. My brother Dale Golden. We're here. We're invited by Dan Mack because we've had experience in the child custody uh, arena. And uh, he wanted us to call in and listen and then uh, answer any questions or give any details of our experience. Well, Dan, well, tell, us the, tell us your thoughts and, and the connection because you, you, you wrote this long letter to me. Well, I, I wish I had it in front of me now, but... Um... You know, first of all, I have a, a rather dismal look of this at the system. I don't, I don't really expect the system to change much. 
And so in a nutshell, I think it has to all take place at home, um, you know, where, where, you know, where Christ is at the center of it all. And unfortunately, that's really a minority of households anymore. Um, I, I also told Charles and uh, the retired senator, I think that that email went to, about the UCC one, and I didn't get a chance to get any feedback from Charles on, I, I heard of some people registering their, all of their private property, even their children's in, in the all caps name on a UCC one filing or a UCC three amendment. I don't remember exactly how that worked anymore. So that child protective services or the agents of the government no longer can, can make claims on them so freely if that should ever, you know, happen. Well, well, may I adjust something real quick? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, first, we've got to understand how they've taken control of the assets that you refer to as your children and your family. How they named it an asset that they can take away from you. So then we have to go back to God's original plan and what God said that we're all belonging to God and none of this man-made system has any jurisdiction unless we choose it to have jurisdiction and we give it authority. So as long as we're standing true under God and we are understanding that we're not part of this system, that we're standing separate, and then you have to document that somehow. So one way of doing that is setting up a ministry under the 508C1A and setting yourself up as, as a, a Melchizedek royal priest under God from the throne room of God, which is God's rule and authority of his government over all creation, and we become his sector, his rod of authority on the, in this plane. So when you step into that understanding of who you are as a royal priest, that is, you have three areas of responsibility. The first area is being a firstborn out of the biblical understanding of the firstborn and responsibility and managing all the assets for the whole family and being a leader in the family and having control of all the resources for the family, for the family. So you have responsibility as firstborn. Then you have a responsibility as a sovereign, king, ruler, over other people who's attached themselves in, under, in your network of your family. Dean, so, Dean could, yeah. could we... Could we have Dale share what happened to him and how that materialized, how it started, what the situation was? Sure. I, I just want to finish this real quick. Okay. I'm coming to a closing point here. So, so we have a responsibility of sovereign, king, ruler, and you have a responsibility of being a priest of God, bringing, reconciling and bringing praise and glory back to God. And so your responsibility is to teach the kingdom of God and to bring everything and everyone back to God away from this world. And this world is designed to kill and destroy anything that is revering God. So, so we've got to understand this is a continuation of the biblical story of Lucifer being kicked out of heaven is trying to raise his throne over God's throne. And this is a continuation of that. So what we're experiencing in our day and time now is uh, the battle, a spiritual battle that's being fought out in the physical. So you have to first step into the spiritual understanding of who you are and who you are of God and that of Lucifer, not of this world. So you got to understand there's a difference there. And how do they document that they've got authority over you 
is through your birth certificate and through all these adhesion contracts and everything that they created. Then you got to learn how to step out from away from all those adhesion contracts and stand firm in who you are as a created creation of God, not a creation of the system. So once you understand the separation, and then it's just figuring out how to get them to recognize you as being the exception to their rule. And that's giving notice through the 508C1A is part of that process. And so I, uh, let me I've just- gotta, have, I've, 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 gotta, I've, I've gotta ask you a very direct question. Do you yes. think, do you, do you believe that any part of the governments of California or the United States will respect uh, the positions you're taking? Uh, no, because they're all of uh, Lucifer under the umbrella of what they label as Democrats, and they are all socialistic, trying to control, dominate, and to destroy anything that resembles God, that reverence God. So they're trying to destroy all that. So we are protected by God once we stand firm with God and that God flow through us and we don't take anything personal. We don't have a an attitude of revenge or hurt or anything because we're standing firm with God and we have no worries because God hand, handles it all. But yes, the system that we're under here is definitely controlled by that Luciferian mindset is destroying. And in my opinion, we as citizens standing with God and God flowing through us need to hold the elected official accountable for treason against the humanity. And the South Agency is part of that treason. IRS is part of that treason. Uh, all of this is part of the treason. And then then the COVID-19 is another part of that treason to destroy the integrity of the freedoms of the god fearing people. But we need to stand up and put them all under arrest and hold them accountable for treason. Charles, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Wouldn't the courts deal with this by saying uh, the position that uh, was just taken by uh, the the speaker Coach, is yeah. is asking the court to recognize an ecclesiastical authority over the courts and um, most courts in the United States take a very uh, strong stand against recognizing ecclesiastical courts because the ecclesiastical courts no longer have any any efficacy in our system. The First Amendment separated any authority the ecclesiastical courts would have. Isn't that where what what they would say here? Yeah. They would, as the same token, that works as a double-sided sword. So it cuts against them. This is was the same argument. Uh, Lynette, I, I I feel like we're kind of leaving you out out of out of all this, uh, and I want to try to bring it back to your topic. I mean, this is maybe something a little bit further afield from than what we originally were planning on. Uh, talking about, but okay, uh, do you do you have any thoughts on the alternative to the family courts? I mean, what's that noise? I don't know. I'm um, not sure. Um, uh, because I mean, I, I I really I wish there was a way we could come up with something, because I mean, me being an infant adopted out. I mean, I, I, I'm sure those records are sealed. I'm sure it was a sealed adoption. I have no, I can't get access to those records. I don't know what really happened. I mean, my parents could have been great parents for all I know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all just a big cluster wonk. And I don't even think I have a real, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I my was, husband and I, I, I were, was... I, I was talking about you, the, 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 the situation at hand, though, uh, rather yeah. than going, going back to your, your childhood. I, I wanted to know, and I mean, this is something that I'm very interested in. What are the alternatives yeah, to the family system? Because you yourself 
acknowledged the other night that, okay, child abuse is a serious matter. Uh, child abuse is a serious matter. If the stories that were told about your husband, and uh, you know, maybe on the on a on, on a third uh, on a, on a third installment of this, we can get Jack involved. But uh, I. Yeah, I have to do something. Yes. I have to do something too. Oh, if it were possible. Haley needs to take me. What alternatives are there to, I mean, yeah, yeah. Dan yeah. and uh, I, I forget what the name of the fellow in area code 312. Hmm? This is Coach Dean, Dean, Dean and my brother is Dale. Dean. And Dale wants to tell his story. Okay, let, let, I mean, let, I think let, there let should me. be, yeah, some kind of oversight committee, something, some kind of family, well, something, you well, know? I mean, or, could it, or, or could it be, I mean, what would your reaction be Mommy, to you make some uh, a restoration of some moral church, uh, e ecclesiastical, oh, some sort of... Uh, involved. This is your grand grandson. Grandson. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. right. He's we the next did, generation, three right? Three generations here. here. That's he right. Wasn't, he wasn't introduced the other night. Yeah, he wasn't. <laughs> this is my grandson. My daughter's Haley, the seventeen-year-old. This is her child. So Haley, yeah, Ezra. Me. Ezra. Ezra, the helper. Is that what Ezra means? Yes, Ezra means helper in Hebrew, I believe. I, I did not know that. I did not know that. Uh, anyhow, I, I guess what I'm really hoping to focus on since this has come up is would any of us be willing to allow in uh, as a matter of fact, uh, religious, ecclesiastical, whatever you want to call it, spiritual input <coughs> into the family courts. Uh, Sean mentioned the First Amendment. I will tell you that I think that is an appallingly erroneous uh, and false interpretation of the, the First Amendment, but he's quoting the Supreme Court. Uh, he, he, he's, not, he, he's, not, he's not wrong about what the Supreme Court has been saying. I just think that the Supreme Court itself, the United States Supreme Court, falsify uh, 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 falsified the, uh, the 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 original meaning of uh of, of the first amendment the, the this this concept of a wall between erecting erecting a wall between church and state was never ever discussed in the 1780s 1790s or early early 19th century uh and so in terms of reform, I mean, I'll tell you what my th my thoughts on the family courts are. On the, my thoughts on the family courts are that they are fundamentally unconstitutional. And yeah, that, that's the way I feel about family courts too. I I. I I echo your grandson's <laughs> sentiments 100%. I think, I think he's got exactly the right attitude here. Uh, Sorry, let me mute myself. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it, we, you know, I remember an, a, a Christmas many long years ago when, when I, had a, a, I had a newborn son, uh, a four month old son, and uh, we, were, we were in church uh, and our son was making a bit of a ruckus and uh, Father Holt at Bethesda by the Sea in Palm Beach said, if anyone feels that the crying of a child is interfering uh, with their enjoyment of Christmas Eve, please see me after the service for a special counseling. <laughs> So uh, the, 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 the participation of, of children in a discussion about family law is not a problem for me. <laughs> it is not a problem for me, but, uh, I, but I, let, can everybody just react to that for a minute? Would it be desirable from a Canadian standpoint or a William Penn State standpoint 
uh, or uh, a Lutheran Christian standpoint, uh, to reintroduce religion into the family courts? As an option? Uh, yes, it, it might be. Uh, and uh, I don't know where, where this leads us, but th there was an attempt in, in Ontario, uh, in the province I live in, under our pre previous lesbian pre premier, uh, Kathleen Wynne, to allow Sharia courts to operate uh, in, in, fa in family, family, family dispute situations. Well, that came in for a lot of criticism. Um, the, the, I, guess, I guess one problem I see is that not, not everybody you know, is churched. Um, uh, um, what do you do with that substantial number of people who don't affiliate with a church, uh, maybe who are vaguely Christian, but don't, uh, do, do, would they want to subject, subject themselves to, to say the judgment, which would probably be more compassionate. Uh, you know, of, <laughs> of Episcopalian or whatever. Well, well, we call them Anglicans up here, but uh, I guess it's Episcopalian south of uh, the 49th. But uh, I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting suggestion. Uh, uh, Charles? Can I, I speak on that? Yes. This is Dale. I, uh, as far as church goes, they're, they're the system is set up geared towards money, not yeah. not holding the family together, not helping the family to take care of whatever the situations that that cause them to get involved. Right, uh, it's all revenue to them. I a divorce is a revenue, a marriage is a revenue, a childbirth is a revenue. Right. Uh, if you go into medical situations, those are revenue. Everything is revenue related. So even if you have a church religion thing brought back into the court, goes back to revenue. They're not there to support and help the family. They're there to to help themselves to revenue. They'll separate the family. Uh, they actually came in as pretense to help me out, and they divided my kids up between the church members. Then so that turned out to be where they were trying to steal the kids away from me, from the family, destroy the family, and make a new family, make them members of the, you know, because they, they thought they were do a better job than I was doing. I, instead of coming in and helping me with my situation, all right, so it, uh, it's not, that's not the total solution, bringing in religion or church back into court. What it is, is to bring the family into God. That's where it's at, and then leave it in God's hands, all right, and to let go. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the simple truth is that uh, we have become too dependent at this stage as a society on social solutions. I mean, would anyone disagree with that, that, that as a society, whenever we have problems, we look to the government to resolve it? I, I'd like to add to that. Uh, uh, in my situation, in my situation, real quick, uh, to let you know, the courts end up apologizing to me and giving back my whole family back to me. So you won. Uh, I don't know if you're interested in hearing what happened or how it happened or what we did uh, in the process. I but there there was a process. I that worked. And Perhaps Charles, that would make. Money, Share my situation, but uh, I don't want to go into all this trying to change everything. It's it's more it's not a change more than this more than an acceptance. I but as soon as you give in to them and you uh, they scare you into signing some. Um, 
for your not what's the word I'm looking for? Um compliance. Well, you know, I I, I think that uh we're we're basically kind of going off. I mean, this is a very interesting uh, digression here, but it's it's not quite uh, you know where we we're headed headed with Lynette. And I appreciate Dan Dan introducing us. And um, you know, we will probably have to do this on a on, right. on, on a separate right. show I, I here. Thanks, thanks for your honesty. I, I don't have time to, right now. Uh, so I'm gonna let you guys go, and maybe sometime in the future we can get together. Well, I certainly hope. But right so. now, I, 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 have, I have, I have, I have nine kids, right? And the, the the family that was united back in the courts, and the process that we went through, I can share what we went through. But if you're not interested, fine. I'll talk to you another time. I mean, well, thank you, you very much for coming. Back. Thank you so much. Anyhow. I mean, it brings up all sorts of interesting problems, uh, but I mean, there, there, there are two thoughts that I've had about how we could reform and the, you know, the libertarian in me uh, says that, I mean, uh, obviously I'm a fan of ancient Rome and, and Greece and uh, in, in, a, in ancient times, there was only one way that courts could ever get involved in a family matter, and that was through contract, through the enforcement or interpretation of contract. Yeah, that's where I enrolled you, yeah. And I mean, one, one solution would be that uh, mm -hmm. yeah. we, could, we could basically, I, I would kind of favor this, but I don't want everybody's reaction to it, we could abolish the family courts and say that courts will only get involved to the degree that families have created contracts among themselves. The ancient, the ancient Roman, the ancient Greek, uh, uh, and even the, the ancient Egyptian contracts for marriage, they covered issues like, I mean, separation. They, the, the, the typical exhortation was, let this couple live in happiness and prosperity. But if not, uh, but if not, you know, they, they talk, they'd come in advance and talk about who was going to get the kids, who was going to get the fig trees, uh, <laughs> who was going to get the carriages, uh, who was going to get the cattle. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, if, if there are, you know, X number of kids, this will happen. If there are X number of cattle, <laughs> That will happen, uh, and they 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 consider. The thing is in a room, I think. The one one we'll thing. Go back thing after my no, call. I, one I, thing I, that this would do is it would require people to think real hard about you know their life plan, and in a sense, it would uh, resuscitate that absolutely hateful old-fashioned concept of individual responsibility. Yes. That makes a lot of sense, uh, Charles. I'm going to have to leave the conversation, but if I don't get a chance to do it before, uh, before I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Thank Merry you. Christmas Thank to you. you. And uh, I want. It was to nice to meet you. I, uh, <laughs> Paul, I hope that you'll be willing to come back and continue this dialogue uh, at, at a future date because I, I think this is really key and critical to uh, you know the the larger issues that we we're concerned with in terms of the, the, the survival of Western civilization. I agree with you, and yes, I would. OK, God, God bless the Red Ensign. Thank you. Well, you know, Charles, one thing that struck me about uh, Paul is Paul's still under the crown, where they actually have a much more inquisitive system than what we have. And Paul was aston astonished at how inquisitive American judges have become to the point that he thinks, boy, we would never allow that here in Canada. And I just thought to myself, boy, isn't that quite a change where you have a Canadian who's under the crown justice system saying that they can't get over how inquisitive an American judge is acting so esponte because uh, the crown is much more inquisitive than uh, um, Haley, system, you know? Haley. I'm not entirely sure that's true, but uh... 
it's uh, it, I mean the, the, our system comes from from England uh, and uh, the, 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 the the crown isn't is in charge of the appointment of prosecutors but that they still have the concept of separation of powers of, uh, you know you're right uh, the, the the crown is is where the, where the the government comes from but the a british judge has seems to me has more authority than a u.s judge to inquire into what's going on in the case does, does he am i wrong about that do they i think you're 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 you're, you're actually wrong uh unless you're yeah. talking about what, the, what they call in england a court of chancery uh they have they have a whole separate branch of of courts uh in england called courts of chancery uh where you don't actually have uh, the the same kind of prosecution as in as in crown courts. In a crown court uh, of of law, uh, the crown is the prosecutor, uh, and uh, you know, and, and so in, in that sense, yes. But the the ju ju judicial power is separate. Uh, a, a chancellor in equity can investigate uh, a little bit more, but actually the the place where you've got courts of inquisition is in the continent in in europe in the, the civil the civil courts uh german and french uh courts uh in particular italian courts spanish courts they are much more uh th there's no, there's no concept of separation of powers there uh really the the judges are the they are the, they are basically the prosecutors and you, you don't have that anywhere in england or the anglo-american system but but dan uh what do you think about uh you know the, the 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 course of judges making up making up facts i mean that that was uh i think what Sh what sean and i found most shocking about lynette's case and I kind of thought from your letter that that was what 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 you were uh, what you found oh. troublesome too that judges basically are completely disregarding the Anglo-American tradition uh, of uh, adversary proceedings and injecting themselves into Look, every. I was on Hello, Lynette. Lynette, what are you saying? Oh, Haley was talking. She's excited because she's wrapping Christmas presents. <laughs> she's excited. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, is my mic working? Huh? Is my mic working? Can yeah, you hear yeah, me? I can hear you. Oh, um, okay. Well, I can hear you. Charles is flattering me because I didn't have that deep of, uh, or at least I wasn't thinking of what you were thinking. I, I guess... I, I guess that, that takes me back to my first comment. I'm just so jaded. I'm so jaded. The more I learn about the system, the more jaded I've become. And I've been hanging out now for years with people who you know, seem to have the ability to address those, or they're trying to find you know, ways to address those. And the discoveries they make along the way about the system and about the world that we live in, in commerce, um, and Dean alluded to it a little bit, a little bit, you know, when he said we've contracted into this system. Uh, and again, Charles, I don't know that you see, you, you agree or see it that way. And I don't know that I, to what extent I believe it. It just, it, it makes more sense when those kinds of, um, what should I say, philosophies are offered, makes a lot more sense to me than to think, we're going to get justice from some some people in the system that are moral. I just, I really don't. I, I, it well, seems the higher you go, the more immoral most of them are. That's what it seems. Lin Lynette, I mean, one thing that maybe uh, you should, could, would you like to explain how you got your kids back? Because I don't think I know that part of the story. I mean, you start off with this atrocious allegation uh, basically that uh, your husband is guilty of really reprehensible conduct with the children. You deny that all along. 
Uh, he, the children deny that all along and basically no one listens. So yeah. How did you, how did you get, get the kids back and, and the, what kind of insights does that give you uh, to the, to the children? I mean, to the system, to the system, to the, ch the, so, the so-called child services, child protective service. Well, when we each, we had a lawyer in the adjudication hearing, and that was our first mistake, even taking a lawyer in there. But once we got rid of our lawyers, we, st we still had to go through all their services. I mean, it was just horrific. This one thing after another, evaluation and parenting classes and this, it just, it drug on and on and on for two years. But what really did it, I think, is my brother-in-law, he's basically just a paralegal, but he knows about criminal law, civil law, corporate law. I mean, he's so smart. He's the one that did all our filings, wrote everything, told us what to file, told us what to do. And he really, he helped us to get our kids back. I also tweeted, I use Twitter, I use social media. I got involved and I got our story out there. I made a banner, a picture of our family with the flag behind it, the United States flag. This is a Marine Corps veteran and I tweeted the heck out of it and got it out there in social media and Facebook and anywhere else I could. And I wrote to the whole, the, like the head of the state of Georgia of all of the facts and told the head of Georgia, I got a hold of their email and emailed them and told them, these people don't know what they're doing. We're innocent. Our kids have been taken. And this is, this is just wrong. We want our kids back. So, I mean, we just didn't stop. We were like, you know, we were like the Marine Corps bulldogs with our, I mean, you know, we weren't going to stop until we got our kids back. And, you know, it's just, that's just what we did. We just didn't give up. In essence, I mean, what you're saying is you went outside the system. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, we we buck, it basically. Yeah, we bucked the system, and like like that's that, that's what Jack said. That's why they were mad. That's why they were so mad is because we bucked the system. We didn't go along. We didn't cow down and say, okay, all right. I mean, we did everything they wanted us to do, but we still bucked them along the way. We said, okay, boom. Here's X, Y, Z. Here's this. I had to go to family violence meetings. I, I went to, he went to anger management and family violence meetings. And we went to all that. That wasn't even part of the narrative. I know, right? Charles, I have a question though. I still can't understand how is the judge able to take away children from the parents when the, the government exercises discretion not to, not to file a criminal charge? I don't understand uh, yeah. that because the government is saying we don't believe a crime took place or we don't have any evidence of a crime. So if the if the government is saying we don't have evidence of a crime, therefore, we're not going to file a charge, then they run the family court and they're saying we don't have a, evidence of a crime, so we can't file a charge. We want you to take their kids away because we can't get them on something in, in criminal court. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court, because we filed a habeas in Supreme Court and the Supreme Court judge. He wouldn't touch it. He would not. He he would. Oh, my gosh. He said, no, the the, the adjudication order, this stands. He, you know, he just I mean, wow. And in the or in the in the order that uh, was entered, I mean, the it, the the judge said, I, I think this is the bizarre statement. The judge said it was not made up. It is not a fiction. Was, wasn't that the word? It is not a, it is not a fiction or a fabrication. Is that I, it? I, I, what I can't get around it though, Charles is why wasn't there a criminal charge levied? You, you see what I'm saying? There was no fact finding process. Well, okay. Because it basically isn't necessary to, to serve the government purposes. The government purpose is to make these people dependent. I mean, in other words, they had Lynette and her husband, Jack, had to restructure their lives 
entirely on getting their kids back in their lives. Why? That okay. Made them dependent. Okay, but is there any statute in any state that says if family court takes children away based off of an allegation of a criminal act of abuse, that the government has a limited number of, of, of months before it can file a criminal charge alleging that, that abuse? Because if the well, government you just kick them. If the government says, well, you're, we're not going to file criminal charges, Your Honor. At that point, isn't that enough for the family court to say, well, if you're not filing criminal charges, you're telling me there was no crime. If you're telling me there's no crime, I can't take, I'm not going to take the kids away. I can't take the kids away. Okay, the, 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 every, every court has a different burden of proof. And every, every system of law has a different burden of proof. And the, the order that they were applying in uh, the, 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 the standard of proof they, they seem to have been applying uh, in, in this uh, case that, you know, Lynette was involved in, it appears to be mere suspicion. Mere suspicion or suggestion was enough. And that is because of this doctrine called the best interests of the children. The doctrine best interests of the children effectively eviscerates every other concept uh, in, in the law because a judges are given the power and discretion to do whatever they think is in the best interests of the children. And it is a completely subjective uh, standard. Uh, well, the, it, the way that opinion read without explicitly saying it and almost explicitly saying it, the judge essentially said, just in case it's true, we're going to yeah, implement this. Exactly. exactly. We're going to implement this punishment just in case it's true. So what recourse does it be right, by the way, I think that is a correct analysis. What recourse does a person then have because there was no criminal charge filed, so he doesn't have a right to appeal. And um, the kids, when the kids become of age, then the issue becomes moot. So the no, courts it will. Not. It does not become moot. As a matter of fact, that is really what's going on in the, uh, in the Beavers family right now. What's going on what is... in the Beavers family is that they are contemplating what happens when the first kid turns 18 and what the first kid when the first kid turns 18 they she wants to file suit and she will file suit against the abuse she suffered the kid could file suit yes basically i mean the yes the yes the parents have that uh, have that right too but i mean uh, i don't think lynette wants to talk about the fact that they have been slimed uh, they have been the subject of retaliatory prosecution in a completely separate matter, or almost completely separate matter. Uh, in order and, to create, okay, so that's just what I'm getting at. So they, they, they chose not to file a criminal charge in this case, which is, as far as I'm concerned, and what I'm concerned with apparently doesn't matter, but it seems to me that because they chose not to file a criminal charge, they were saying, we don't have anything to back up the allegations we're making in family court. So and then so they then they went out and they're trumping something else up to make it look like, well, we eventually found something. I, Lynette is mm -hmm. nodding and Lynette is nodding. And I think that that's exactly well, good. I mean, I mean, it, 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 it matters in the sense. I mean, uh, I don't think that the word substantiation was in that order, but Lynette was saying that, you know, the, the, the this is one of the fa fa favorite uh, Department of Children and Family Services uh words it was the allegations were substantiated it is a lower it was a it's a lower proof of uh the bar of the, like yeah it, it, it's, what did they call it i can't remember what she called substantiation. it substantiation but what i don't understand and i'm struggling with this is how could anybody claim that the allegations are substantiated if the same cause the the only the evidence was evidence alleged evidence that something similar happened someplace else at a different point in time to somebody else right and a, a daughter through a different marriage yeah and, and, right mm -hmm. okay so so the judge said because i find that it happened there in a completely different place in a completely different state in a completely different jurisdiction 
I'm finding that it happened there. Therefore, it had to have happened here too. Mm-hmm. So that the judge has said it had to have happened here too, had no jurisdiction whatsoever in the other state, in the other place, the other time. But the judge said, I find the testimony of one of the witnesses of the alleged events at the other point in place and time to be credible. But I find the testimony of the other witness at the at that very same other alleged point in time to be not be credible. There, and the reason and the reason that one is credible is because so much time went by and that somehow added credibility. And the reason the other one is in, not credible is because so much time went by went by and that takes away from the credibility, which is a ridiculous argument to begin with. But if there was any credibility to the other argument, right? The other allegation. Isn't the witness who the judge found to be credible herself guilty then of not reporting a crime if it actually happened? Because it's like she's saying that the one, the sister who said says she witnessed something many, many years ago, the stepsister, the older one, uh, the stepsister of Lynette says, well, Your Honor, years ago, I saw something and thank God I was there because I intervened and I stopped it from happening. Right. So if the judge says, OK, that other witness is credible, well, then the witness's own testimony is that she she didn't see something happen. She saw a situation that she thought could result in something happening and she intervened to make sure it didn't happen. So if she's credible, then her that credible testimony is that something did not happen. So how did do you understand what I'm saying? Because she intervened. Yeah. yeah how do you take a father being affectionate with his daughter and turn it into something horrendous? You know. Okay. I mean, he was All right. Not- now, okay. All right. Okay. Now let's say that. Okay. Now that part there was like saying something did happen. So then, no, if the testimony- I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that. But yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. So, but if the judge says, "Okay, that means something did happen," then isn't the witness who's testifying to have seen something happening also testifying to the fact that she failed to report that she saw something happen? You see what I'm saying? Because if something mm-hmm. happened, didn't she, ha- as an adult, she, her duty wasn't to intervene. Yeah, why didn't she call the police? Her duty was to call the police. Exactly. But, but, so, it, so when I read the judge's reading of that testimony, the testimony to me either said, at that different place and time in a completely different state and a completely different jurisdiction, that alleged witness either really saw something and really intervened to make sure it didn't become a crime. If that's the case, then she's making herself out to be the hero, right? And then noth- and she's also testifying that nothing actually occurred. So if nothing occurred, then the testimony is that nothing happened, not that something did happen. However, if her argument is, no, 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 I saw something happen and that's so- that thing I saw was a crime. And then I, then I took the bull by the horns and I intervened so that another crime wouldn't happen. Well, then you're admitting that, okay, great. You, you, you're, you're the, you're the hero, but is she really trying to make up for the fact that she saw something happen? She didn't report it as a crime, but she's making up for it by saying, yeah, but I prevented it to make sure another one didn't happen. And boy, do I deserve credit for that. So either way, either, either of those two arguments, I think makes that witness uncredible not credible because if that witness saw a crime and didn't report it well how in the world is she credible right because she she <laughs> would be complicit right if she says oh but it didn't evolve to a crime you see i'm the hero because i intervened grabbed the situation by the horns and stopped it before there could be a crime well now you're testifying that a crime never happened because you just said you stopped it before it could happen so i don't i don't see how how that testimony at all should even be weighed in i think it should it should have been out because of Frickin. the crime absolutely it was, it, was, it, been. it was contra it was contradicting oh, in and, of and she testified over the phone yeah over the telephone it, it 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 just it seemed to me that this person this other person could very well have just had some sort of she had a beef with my husband yes that, that's, that's what exactly I was what it was mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Mommy, 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 i got 2k just for 25, I got two K. Did you? Yeah, the last time I only got a thousand. Only a thousand? Okay. No, we we lost Charles. I think I may, I, Charles is getting frustrated with my, uh, 
uh, my, my my reading of the opinion but uh, but i, I well can't yeah have... i pulled the, i actually pulled it out of my uh, no, I'm my not. bin and i've I actually got know. it right here no, i'm looking no. over it I'm, because I'm i actually sorry. found the hard copy I, I think you're doing you're doing you're doing you're doing right Sean. because we literally have i mean there was so much paperwork from two years i mean bins we have like bins and binders <laughs> yeah two years oh, of paperwork. okay so an appeal was filed of this, right? That, that many finding? appeals, many appeals. We and filed no, and, a habeas. All our appeals got denied. Every appeal got denied. And they said that that adjudication order was gold. They were holding on to that adjudication order. They were sticking to that. And those kids were staying right where they were and they weren't going to budge. Okay. But now that it's after the fact, okay, well, how did the budging come about? Because eventually they budged. They clearly budged. Right? Because we found some lawyers that I found, I found a Marine Corps lawyer that Jack, I mean, he's a good lawyer. I mean, he's a good lawyer. He knows his stuff. He was a prosecutor in Florida. So when they and gave the, when, when they gave your children back, did they say anything about the previous opinion? Did they, did they comment on it? Did they say the previous opinion was wrong or did they just say, okay, here, the kids are back and. We're just going to pretend that previous opinion wasn't there. Yeah, basically, they just, you know, hemmed and hawed and, you know, yeah, they skipped around it. They didn't even. Yeah, they totally okay. skipped around the whole topic of everything. And okay, her no. only thing was, oh, well, we don't care if you get divorced. <laughs> we don't care if what? We don't care if you get divorced. Yeah, I, I think that they were trying to put that suggestion in there to try and encourage a divorce because then that would make it that would get would give some vindication. A divorce right. would give some vindication to it would say, you see, Your Honor, we knew there were problems there. They ended up getting divorced. And I'm sure in this situation, many people do. And my question would be, well, do you think maybe the divorce could have anything to do with the fact that you raided their family? You know, but clearly you guys didn't get divorced and that's good. But um so then it was after the children, after after another court got rid of that old decision and said, OK, well, here's a new decision. The family goes back together. After that happened, then came the digging to try and try and trump up another charge. Right. Something happened with our daughter in the neighborhood we were living in because we went back to the same neighborhood instead of leaving the state, moving out of the state, moving out of the jurisdiction. <laughs> which I really wanted to do, but you know, we didn't financially weren't financially able to do that. That's that so, now you have. I mean, now oh, you yes. have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, now what's interesting is okay. Her. How come how okay, then how come they didn't try to take the children away again, you know? So they, they didn't do that, so they backed off, which Don't means give them ideas. I know. <laughs> but my, my point is they they backed <laughs> off, and by backing off, they're essentially saying. Well, they got egg on their face and now they're trying to get some, they're, 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 they're clawing to try and get somebody on something because they essentially lost the first time and they're stomping their feet. That's what this looks like to me without, without knowing any more that that's what it, what it looks like. And it just, again, going back to that opinion, the whole, everything in that opinion was just, uh, was awful. Really. It was just the, the judge made evidence and it was all, any, any allegation that said this person did something evil will be taken to be true. Any, any counter allegation that says, no, uh, this person didn't do something evil, evil lies in the allegation and the person making the allegation, that will, that'll be taken to be false. And that's, I just, I don't understand. If the standard she's using is that allegation itself is enough to, to levy it. Sean, you're, you're not paying attention to my theme. You're not paying attention to my theory, and I want to turn to Dan for a minute. Dan and I met in a very different field of law. But Dan, in an eviction case following an illegal foreclosure in California, does the judge ever pay any attention to the illegality of a foreclosure? Are you there? Dan Mack. I don't think so. No, they don't. Because the outcome is what's important. What's important in, a, in an eviction case to perfect 
uh, a California non-judicial foreclosure, all of which basically are illegal, uh, to perfect that process, you have only one possible outcome, and that is to evict the people who have been wrongfully foreclosed on. And in exactly the same way, you have to either get the people to divorce, get the couple to divorce, and or take their children away in order to maximize the state's power. And I think that what we really need to focus on in family and private property uh, and, you know, the state, as in the election, the family, private property, and the state, the courts are actively involved in subverting all three institutions for the furtherance of, what did Lynette text me about this morning? I hate this communist country. It is a country that has adopted the, the, the ideology and the yeah, practices of communism. What time do we uh, close? Okay, give me five minutes. In essence, I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but people like Sean and Jack, who were in the armed forces and fighting for liberty, they were in, in essence fighting to empower our government to turn completely red in the sense of communist, not in the sense of Republican. <laughs> Did I lose everybody all simultaneously? No. No, I, I think you're right. I think there's no question that our, our country's uh, moving, uh, not just socialist, but communist. I think we're absolutely doing that. Um, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at a complete loss here because it just seems like there's so, there's so much power here that was exercised over, over this, this family and the courts just seem to have so much ridiculous amount of power and particularly family court. And, and, and like I told you, there's a woman just elected judge and her, her the brag in the newspaper was that she came from a family that had 40 foster children. Their parents had 40 foster children in their lifetimes. And that was celebrated. The paper wasn't saying that's, that's a terrible thing. How, how can you raise 40 children and they all turn out you know, okay? I mean, clearly they had been denied affection because how could 40, how could you have show affection for 40 people, right? And the court wasn't, the, the paper wasn't, the paper was celebra celebrating the fact that the person had 40 as if it's a competition. So if another, another person came out and said, well, we've had 70 foster children in our family, <laughs> then, then the paper would say, wow, 70, wow. And they would get more, more of a reward, you know, more praise. And, and Let this that judge elect is essentially bragging that that is her brag as to why she's so qualified for family court because she came up through the family foster system and I, i'm thinking that's exactly why you're, why you're not qualified to be a family court judge because you don't you've never no. lived you've never you don't have a family you were in a foster care system with 40 siblings yeah, that's not a family that that's an orphanage by another name that's what that is that's an orphanage operating under the guise of a family that's funded by the county courthouse family and youth services, right? So, you know, that the family and youth services paid for, uh, I guess, the house, paid for like all, all that, that cash flow that comes through having foster children. You know, I guess that's where all the money came from for the family, the, the foster mill. You know, you, you grew up in an orphanage called a family. That's not a family. When everybody else says family, they're talking about the mother, the father, the two kids, maybe three kids. You know, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about 40 foster kids. 40 foster kids yeah. is not a family. That's an orphanage. You know? Well, I mean, uh, Charles, we've, oh. we, we, we've got a little issue here. Uh, and I want to uh, address it front on. And if we have to, if we need to suspend uh, process to discuss it right now, maybe we We've been talking for almost two hours and I want to give everybody a chance to escape if they need to, but Lynette just brought up a fear. May I speak it? Mm -hmm. May I speak it? Uh, Lynette just sent yeah. me this, this message that uh, Jack, her husband, uh, said that this is dangerous. Our conversation is dangerous. And uh, if the prosecutor uh, sees this, they could use it against them. I 
challenge any prosecutor to oh, attack or question what we are talking yeah. about. It is the absolute truth. It is objectively real. And we are exercising our First Amendment rights to petition for redress of grievances here. We are contemplating a, a petition for redress of grievances here. We are discussing our freedom of religion here. We are discuss, discussing our most fundamental rights, according to the United States Supreme Court, to protect our family and our homes. This is the essence of what it means to be an American, to have this discussion today. And I double dare any prosecutor anywhere in the United States to question us. I will go to Rock Hill. I will go to Charlotte. Uh, I will bring, if I can drag him, I will bring Sean, I will bring Dan, and we will talk about what our rights are as American citizens. Uh, it is, this is the most important conversation anyone can be having in the United States today is whether we are going to bow down and submit I mean, Lynette just told us that the only reason there are three kids running around in their house right now is because she went outside the system, she went on social media, uh, she told her story, and basically she shamed uh, the authorities, the head, of the, uh, I, as I understand it, the head of uh, Georgia Department of Families and Children into giving back her kids. I was going to ask her, though, do you have any idea how much the, the foster parents? Me why? Look, it's literally four thousand. I know. I looked it up. It's like thirteen dollars a day. Thirteen dollars a day because it they actually just changed the number because I per day per child per day per child per child and it's by age too it's I by age i can't remember what what the numbers are exactly and how much does the state of georgia get yeah they I don't... get paid a multiple of that yeah I mean, you multiply because they are providing the services 1700 of... days times 13 dollars a day don't have a calculator so <laughs> i mean dan dan's friend who came in briefly was spot on this is a matter of, of finance. This is a matter of taking wealth from the people, taking liberty from the people and paying for it. Otherwise known in constitutional law as slavery. They are treating your, your children as chattels. Uh, chattels is a word that is related to the word mm -hmm. chattel. Chattel, mm -hmm. And they are using your children for profit. That is the entire uh, engine. And I mean, Paul, Paul is gone right now, but he meant, but I asked, I was asking him uh, if they have the same program in Canada that they have in the United States. Every state is bragging now about how many children oh, they're putting into foster care. It is a, it is a, it is a sub, oh, look at that beauty. I mean, I want to make her life better, and I just don't know how to protect her from the things that are happening in this society right now. Other, I mean, I really do think that abolition of the family courts is one of the possible routes. And, you know, that doesn't mean if we abolish the family courts, it doesn't mean an establishment of state religion, although the First Amendment arguably applied only to the federal government, by the way. Okay, Charles, just let me point this out. Um, I, in the past, I tried to find out how much money comes into uh, Pennsylvania for workforce development uh, resources. And um, of that, how much how, how much uh, money per uh, any unit of measurement, let's say person who gets workforce development resources comes into the state, how much of it makes it to a person, how much of it ends up in uh, these various NGOs, 502, whatever's, and how much money gets clipped off for the state government. And um, 
I was never able to get everything I wanted. Um, that's part of the reason the government came after me with uh, harassment charges, uh, because I wouldn't back off of requesting uh, this type of information. And uh, anytime I did get information, it was very clear to me that they set up a, uh, a funding stream where um, the government, right off the bat, the states clip off uh, a very large amount of the block grant for themselves. Then it goes down to the counties. The counties clip off a bunch and it goes to another NGO, a 502. They clip something off. They subcontract to somebody else. The subcontractor clips something off. By the time you get done, there's no money that actually makes it to uh, what, what's supposed to uh, be funded. And I think the foster care system is very much so the same same thing, you know. So um, I, I would love to find out how much money each state gets and then how much where it gets clipped down the way. And I would imagine that um, the families that are getting the money uh, to be the foster care farms um, are not getting anywhere near the amount of money that the, the government is clipping off at the state capital to pay for a headquarters with a bunch of general counsel lawyers and a general counsel's office, a bunch of administrative assistants, stuff like that. If you go and you try to find that information, they're going to come after. They're going to say you're harassing them with uh, requests request for information. They're going to file some kind of nonsense charge against you to get you on something. So you have to stop, you know. But um, anyway, I think I think that would be a very good way to go about it for what you're trying to do. I think that that would probably be the way to go. I, I, it just in Pennsylvania, we have a we have that same problem with the, what, what I'll call Orphanages by another name. Oh, or like, his phone and I'll call. Like so many well, foster kids. Sent me uh, an interesting uh, thing. That um, is this for yeah? This is for Georgia. How much do do foster parents get paid in Georgia uh, for ages zero through five? Monthly stipend is seven hundred and sixty-eight sixty-three. Daily stipend twenty-five uh, point twenty-seven. Uh, then six to 12, the total amount goes up, but the daily stipend goes down. That's kind of weird. I don't know how that works. Um, it says 829, 16, uh, 16, and then 13 and up, 901, 85, 29. Wow. I think there's a, there, there must be an error there because the amount goes well, up between the bottom and line. But, but again, that, 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 is, that, that, that is a form of welfare to the foster parents. That's one way of analyzing. It's a form of, but, it, uh, but what Sean is saying is much more significant okay. than it is redistribution of federal money to the states to empower uh, greater, great, greater influence uh, uh, of the states over people's lives. Dan, what are you thinking? Well, it just takes me back to, you know, just real basic <laughs> sayings, follow the money, <laughs> you know, commerce. Um, it's all about commerce. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it takes me back to <clears throat> even people in some of these groups, they would say, well, until we stop paying taxes, <laughs> you know, um, we're just funding interests and and things like wars that we don't really we don't agree with and we don't support <coughs> excuse me <coughs> sound unhealthy oh. and and that's where you know you hear i mean i don't i don't know what the answer is you know um a lot of churches talk about Romans 13, and they say that we're supposed to submit to the authorities that God has ordained, you know, to be our leadership. And um, I'm having a harder and harder time all along when I look at this administration, especially. And, you know, and we're supposed to obey God you, rather than men. How do you rec rec reconcile, uh, render under Caesar that which is Caesar's uh, with turning over the temples of the money changers in the, uh, in the temple. Well, Jesus was angry because they turned a house of prayer, a sacred place into a house of commerce. And I guess what we're talking about here is the sanctity of a family unit, 
and the sanctity of honor and truth telling and witnesses and that that's been pushed you know to the wayside by the skilled attornment <laughs> of attorneys <laughs> um which are just you know it's just endemic to the system and uh agents agents who go oh you know i can work for the government i can get a government job you know and all the benefits there we're all following carrots um I, I don't know what the answer is other than, first of all, for me, it's just to recognize that. And I don't know how many pastors or church leaders really recognize the depth of these, these kinds of issues and statements. Um, Lynette, we're approaching uh, two hours here. Uh, we might want to... Uh, let you put your kids to bed at some point. Uh, yeah. But uh, would you like to make, make some closing comments here? And basically, I want to say to everybody, I think this has been a very interesting, oh, this, has been an incredibly, this has been an incredibly interesting discussion that started uh, mm -hmm. and we, we've gone way beyond what we had started on, on Tuesday. I want to continue going on. I want Sean and Dan, and I hope Paul and Jerry to come back at some point. Uh, but do you have anything you wanted to add at this point, Lynette? <laughs> it has been a very interesting evening. So Lynette, you get the last word here. Yeah, sorry, had to make a call. This, I'm just, yeah, thank you guys. I, you know, I think it's something that could be talked about the the family unit you know preserving the family unit that's just what we want to do as far as the threat of retaliation i want to say if anyone is listening or will listen to this in the future and is con contemplating re retaliation i say please bring it on i can't wait i absolutely positively can't wait i'm waiting for you so anyhow it's a week before Christmas Eve, uh, and I hope that we'll have a chance to gather again before then. But if not, Merry Christmas to everybody, and uh, Happy New Year, and we will continue this discussion. And if there is retaliation, it's not going to discourage us. It's going to make us 10 times more determined. So Dan, thank you. Sean, thank you. Lynette, thank you. Thank you to thank all, you, uh, all the children and to Jack, and let's talk again very as soon as possible, okay? Good night, everybody. All right, bye-bye.